I'd like to welcome Representative Scott Turner, House District 33, from the Frisco area to our community. He is challenging Representative Joe Strauss for the Speaker of the Texas House seat when the 84th legislative session opens in January. Welcome to San Angelo. Uh, you. We, you just tore up the Tea Party meeting and uh, had a tremendous positive reaction from them. Um, but since most of our viewers may not be familiar with you, except for all those football fans we have out here, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And San Angelo has been so welcoming to me, uh, such wonderful people here. Uh, yes, ma'am, I did play football uh, in the NFL. But I think more importantly, you know, I'm a loving husband to my wife, Robin, uh, and to my nephew, Solomon, who my wife and I took in. Uh, and we've had him full time for several years now. He's a wonderful young man. Uh, and I'm also, you know, a, a Christian young man involved in the ministry. Uh, and I have been uh, since my playing days in the NFL. And I love business and entrepreneurship. Uh, and I serve uh, as a corporate pastor and the director of business development for a software company uh, in Addison, Texas. And my wife and I have a custom suit company. Uh, that we make suits for gentlemen because I can't buy my clothes off the rack and so uh, we do that and I work with professional and college and high school athletes uh, particularly football players uh, that are transitioning in and out of uh, college in the NFL. Wonderful. Um, so you were elected in 2012 to the house. Yes ma'am. So what prompted you to challenge Joe Strauss for the speaker's seat? Well, uh, yes, ma'am, I was elected in 2012, uh, House District 33, all of Rockwall County and portions of Collin County. And I think that the, the bigger statement is not just challenging the speaker, but to run for Texas. And, you know, there's a big changing of the guard going on in Texas. It's really a new season Absolutely. Uh, in our state and the statewide elections and all of the elections that we had on November the 4th. Uh, the people in Texas are speaking very clear uh, about the type of leadership uh, that they desire to have in our state. And you know, we have an opportunity here to do some monumental things legislatively as it pertains to border security, uh, as it pertains to budget reform, uh, as it pertains to educational excellence and opportunities uh, for our children here in Texas, the next generation, if you will, and tax relief uh, for hardworking Texans and for our businesses in Texas. So it's not just a campaign about running against the speakers, it's a campaign to run for Texas. Uh, and to ensure that the legislation that Texans want and have cried out for for quite some time uh, don't die uh, in committee or on the calendars, but they come to the floor uh, for debate and for a vote. And I think having the right leadership, uh, you know, we can do that. But um, give me an idea of the difference in leadership that you'll bring to the table versus uh, the leadership that Joe Strauss has, has brought. Well, I think that it's very important that as a leader, one thing that makes up a great leader uh, is building a team, you know, and recognizing in the Texas House, you know, we have some very capable, skillful, uh, talented members. And to allow those skills that are available to you uh, to work, you know, for the objective end, and that's for Texas. Uh, and so I'm more of a team builder, more of a, a, a team uh, leadership aspect. Uh, and also, I believe that those bills that we talked about, the legislation we talked about, they need to have an opportunity to come to the floor. And so it's a, it's a bottoms-up approach that I would bring, you know, uh, more than a top-down approach. And, and also, you know, my life has been a life of service, you know, to, and I think the speaker needs to be the chief servant, you know, of the members whereby they serve their constituency. Very good. Um, I understand that there's already been a lot of politicking going on. Uh, and I understand that you're considering calling for a floor vote. So how will that actually work? Well, yeah, I think it's very important to have a floor vote, but uh, not only me, and you know, I've been calling for a floor vote uh, from day one since I filed, but I also believe that the other uh, side, the, the speaker's teams also recognize, you know, we need to have a floor vote. And I think it's very important that we have an open vote, you know, on the floor in front of our constituency to set a true precedent of transparency and accountability. Uh, and so on the first day of session, January 13, 2015, uh, we will take a floor vote and we have to adopt the rules and then we vote on how we're gonna vote and then obviously we take uh, the floor vote and it's gonna be a great day. 
Texas has some challenges before. Let's talk about a few of them. We have a couple of massive invasions that are happening. Uh, first, uh, what must we do to secure our border and protect Texans from the drug cartels that are flowing over the border? Well, you know, I've been down to the border uh, in the Rio Grande Valley, and it is, it's a war zone and it's real. And we have to take comprehensive measures to secure our border. One, we need to implement E-Verify. We need to eliminate sanctuary cities and take away the magnets, if you will, that, will, uh, that cause people to want to enter our state illegally. And, you know, we have to have bold, bold decision making and leadership to do so. And then to continue on with uh, enforcing and propping up our uh, DPS and keeping our National Guard down there because they are a force multiplier. Just their presence is a deterrent. Uh, and to keep them fun, to keep them there to work on our border. Those are some of the things we can do. I understand that a vote was taken on December 1st by the LBB, the um, Legislative Budget Board, and the way it ended up voting, they didn't continue the National Guard past March. And it's, but the DPS does go through the end of the fiscal year. Is there a way to adjust that? Yeah, you know, I think it's very important that we do keep the National Guard there because I don't want there to be a gap in the, uh, not just the protection, but a gap in the presence of the National Guards there. And so, yeah, that's going to have to be something that we're going to have to vigorously debate and to talk about to make the right decision uh, to not just protect uh, our citizens and our property owners, but really to secure our border in the right way. Absolutely. Uh, the other invasion we've got, we've got people coming here from California and lots of other traditionally blue states. So, you know, Governor Rick Perry, he's done a great job selling our state as the place to be, but the people coming here aren't necessarily coming here with the same, um, well, they're bringing their way of life and their way of thinking, and it's just not Texan. So, um, and then also, of course, uh, with the past uh, elections, we also discovered that Battlegr Battleground Texas was alive and well here, and I think that's still going. So what do we need to do to maintain Texas, the home that we love? Well, and that's a great question, and, and very simply, the people of Texas uh, that are here, the people that have been in Texas, the people that are Texas, uh, need to be activated and to be uh, involved in the political process, be involved in their sphere of influence, and having the dialogues with people that come here from other states, welcoming them, obviously, to our great state, but also say, hey, these are our convictions, this is, and this is why we stand for what we stand. And, but it takes people not becoming complacent. We need people to be so involved and, activa and activated and saying, hey, you know, this is Texas. This is who we are. And this is why we are who we are. This is why we are the best state uh, in the country. Thank you for coming, but this is how we're going to continue. You know, looking statistically at the past legislative sessions, I believe uh, the, the we've been in the majority. The Republicans have been in the majority in both the House and the Senate for the past several sessions. Yet, I recently learned that the majority of the bills that have passed have been authored by Democrats. Uh, if is this information correct? And if so, do we have a rhino problem, Republicans in name only, kind of working against the conservative elected officials? Well, you know, there's been an issue uh, with conservative legislation coming to the floor. And if you look at the, the metrics, as you look at the formula, we have had 95 Republicans, 55 Democrats. Now we have 98 Republicans and 52 Democrats. And so, so there should not be an uphill battle to get conservative legislation, the people's legislation that people are calling for, for to the floor. And uh, that's kind of been a systemic problem over the last few sessions. And that's something that I've been talking about. And with both sides, I say, listen, the people are calling for this legislation. We have the majority in our house, and we can't squander our majority away. We need to take care of our business while we have this majority. Absolutely. Um, you're visiting out here in West Texas. We get kind of dry out here. Uh, we need more water. Uh, what solutions do you see in helping us with water out in this area? Well, yes, ma'am. You know, water is an issue. Uh, and, you know, I think the permitting process has to be visited and reformed. Because it takes too long to get a permit. Because you have to deal with outside interests, EPA, other special interests. 
And if you quicken or have more accountability in the permitting process, then you can get to work quicker in building reservoirs and lakes and whatnot. And also, you know, there's been talk of desalinization uh, here in West Texas, which I'm open to discussing uh, and being educated upon. Uh, but the permitting process and also uh, getting rid of or reforming the language in the uh, junior water rights transfer. Uh, there's things that we can do to speed up the process, uh, but you ha it's, it's a bold decision to do so because it affects obviously a lot of parties. But if we really need water and want water, then we have to do what it takes to do it. And then we got to do a lot of praying, you know, pray for rain. <laughs> Yeah, God's been good. When yes. we've been down to just a few months of water, He uh, twice in the last two years have given us 22 months worth of rain. Oh, yeah, he's a good God. He, he's a good God. Uh, another issue that we have out here is the oil field. Oh, it's booming. It's wonderful. It's bringing lots of money into the Texas economy, but our roads are being destroyed by those oil field trucks. I mean, these roads were only designed little two-lane roads, but also, even more important than the roads being torn up, are we are losing lives because of these big trucks, you know, barreling down these highways with, you know, passenger cars in between, and we've lost a lot of people. How can we get additional funding to improve our roads out here? Well, you know, we have um, some creative, uh, innovative pieces of legislation um, that need to come forth and need to be brought forth on the Texas House floor. And bills that will not raise taxes or fees, such as two-thirds of the motor vehicle sales tax, being dedicated to transportation. And, you know, there's a lot of hands in the piggy bank at times. And so I think that integrity in government and integrity in, in spending is if, a mon if the monies are supposed to go to roads, then they need to go to roads only. And I think when you do that, then you'll start to see an increase in funding. You'll start to see an increase in the flow of resources uh, for transportation. And then TxDOT. Uh, needs to be held accountable on how they're spending the money that they've been appropriated. Uh, and so those are a few things that we can do, but it is a very, it's a priority. How, how long would it take to transform from the way it is now into a more accountable? Well, you know, that's a good question. You know, it won't happen overnight, but you have to start. You know, and once you do start, you know, we've been very blessed with revenue in our state, and we have a lot of capable people. But you have to start somewhere. But once you start that integrity in government and transparency and keeping the money in Fund 6, State Highway Fund, for roads, you know, then, you know, it may take a couple of sessions, but you got to start somewhere. Um, for, those, for our viewers that don't really follow our state politics uh, closely, kind of explain the power and importance of the Speaker of the House. Why is that, that position so important? Well, the speaker uh, is very important, and in a few ways, the speaker, he sets uh, members in committee, he appoints the chairman in committees, and then has a big role in setting the legislative agenda, along with the governor and the lieutenant governor, and setting the priorities of our state. And it's very important um, that you have the, the person of the speaker is one that leads and governs with the heart and the ear of the people at the forefront. Uh, and also works with the members in such a way uh, to bring about the best results in legislation for our state and for the posterity of our state. So it's a very, very important role uh, as a Speaker of the House. Um, you have a rep reputation of being a very devout Christian. I've got to ask you, how does being a Christian work with being a politician at the same time? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, you know, it's the same way uh, when I played in the NFL. Uh, because the NFL is, is not the, um, you know, the TV and the lights and the glamour. You know, that's on Sunday. But everything that the NFL stands for um, doesn't always line up with my Christian values. Just like any other job, that was just the world in which I lived. But I'm a Christian first, you know, I'm a churchman first. It's who I am as a man. And whatever assignment God gives me, whether it's playing in football or whether it's, you know, preaching in the church or whether it's being in Texas politics, I'm a Christian first. And I think that it's very important because my foundation 
and my principles are extremely strong in him. And my first accountability is to the Father, is to Christ. And so I think it helps me in being a public servant uh, because the decisions that I make are based upon my convictions and my principles. Uh, and not just being a legislator, but first being a Christian servant. If you're voted in as the Speaker of the House, will you become the first black Speaker of the House? Yes, ma'am. No, we just voted in our first Hispanic First Lady of Texas. Looks like a year of first. So you'll be a Christian, a conservative, a Tea Party supporter, a former NFL player, a businessman, a Bible-believing teacher, and I believe a minister as well, a motivational speaker who happens to be black, hopefully representing the heart of God in the decisions that are made in the Texas House. Sounds like a pretty powerful package. Scott Turner, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Yes,